Okay, we're going to continue the discussion on climate change with our panel. Changhua Wu joins us from Beijing. Ms. Wu is the CEO of the Beijing Future Innovation Center. And joining us here in Washington, D.C., Alice Hill, a senior fellow for climate change policy at the Council on Foreign Relations. And also with us on set, Jerome Foster II. He is a climate activist and founder and executive director of One Million of Us. I want to thank you all for joining us. We want to have a lot to get to, so let's move right on to it. Alice, you work closely with U.S. President uh, Barack Obama, and we talked about the Paris Accord. One of the first things that U.S. President Donald Trump did was say that he's going to pull us out of that. What does that signal to the rest of the world? What are your concerns? And this being the nation that clearly benefited the most since the Industrial Revolution, not wanting to help developing nations kind of move forward. What does it say? It sends a signal that they need not worry about this too much. Uh, I think it's a very poor development for the world that the largest uh, historical emitter, second largest emitter, uh, is saying we don't want to be part of what was already a challenged agreement and is the only agreement we have for how to do better with us. So I think it's costly to global consensus on this issue. And specifically about the developing nations, what do you make of that? The, the administration has made it clear it doesn't want to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to, in essence, take care of those nations who have suffered under climate change to this point. Well, I think it's morally wrong, but I also think it's a very short-sighted uh, view because, as we've heard, migration will be one of the most immediate challenges. The numbers of people who will be displaced by climate change are really mind-boggling. It's hard to imagine how many people will need a new home and be on the move, and that is highly destabilizing to the globe in general. And it will be put pressure on America's borders as well as on our national security and global security issues, uh, interests. Human security is very important, and climate change threatens that for so many people. Ms. Wu, I would like to turn to you because President Xi Jinping has really made focusing on climate change one of the cornerstones of his government. How is China moving forward? We talked about the renewable energy, but there are critics, such as uh, David Wallace Wells, who talked about the opening of new uh, coal plants at the same time. Do you think that there is a certain degree of hypocrisy out there for some nations? Let me put that way. That way, I think we are living in a world with a climate crisis, and uh, countries, in particular like China, is taking the best effort it could at this moment. On one side, it has to continue to address the development issue. On the other side, it has to figure out how to address or decoupling actually the development with uh, resources or energy, uh, fossil fuel energy consumption. There, I know worldwide there have been a lot of reports about you know the fast uh, buildup of coal-powered power plants from China. But that's already history. If you look at the numbers there, on one side, China definitely government not approving as many power plants, coal-fired power plants as uh, before. Secondly, the existing operating uh, coal-fired power plants, many of them are already under operated, and uh, many of them being phased out already. On the other side, even for the you know new plants and the supercritical, ultra supercritical technologies are being deployed. So this is the one side of the story. On the other side, as you mentioned, China has been developing very aggressively, investing heavily in renewable energy technologies to deploy them. In now, actually, is the battery technologies. Now, actually, the focus is moving also towards the hydrogen uh, technology there as well. So mm. on the energy technology revolution side, China definitely is also leading as well. Then you put the two t together, the, the numbers have started to, to tell you. On one side, if you look at China's primary energy structure, their coal continues to decrease. And that definitely is the trend already. Hopefully, that's going to be more accelerated. Uh, you know, on the other side, China is developing very fast, very quickly on the renewable alternative energy options there. So I think today, probably, if the numbers tells you, it, it's already t started to tell the trend. And in the coming decades, you know for sure the mm -hmm. pathway is clear. China definitely is on the right track to achieve its low carbon transformation. 
Okay. Jerome, I, uh, firstly, congratulations to you. I don't care where people come down on this issue. It is wonderful to see young people out speaking their minds in a, in, a, in, in, in a wonderful fashion. And you are of this generation that is tired of hearing people my age saying, we're going to get to it. We're going to get to it. And I have to think of uh, Greta Thunberg, of course, recently honored as Times Person of the Year. And this is what she had to say about moving forward. I, I want you to listen to this. But even though the intentions may be good, this is not leadership. This is not leading. This is misleading. Finding holistic solutions is what the COP should be all about. But instead, it seems to have turned into some kind of opportunity for countries to negotiate loopholes and to avoid raising their ambition. She really shames a lot of people my age into thinking a lot differently. What is your goal? What would you like to see happen? And how forcefully do you think you are going to be out there getting your word out? Well, I've been on Climate Strike for 46 weeks at the White House and at Harvard University. And the goals that we've wanted is for universities to de divest from fossil fuels. And we want for world leaders to understand that this is a crisis and that there are millions of young people all across the world that are being displaced by the climate crisis. And then we also want for people to under, to wake up and we want for people to un educate themselves and inform themselves about the climate crisis because the, the public and people that are around the world, they don't really understand the extent to which the climate crisis will impact our lives and impact our future. Mm -hmm. So we want people to educate themselves and join us in climate strikes and then make sure that you're calling your elected officials and getting, making sure that your future is accounted for and making sure your elected officials are understanding the urgency and we want you to make sure that you elect and vote people that will take action and we'll make sure that climate is first on their priority for 2020 in the decade that we have left to tackle climate change. You know, we heard David Wells talk about possibility of four degrees centigrade by the end of, the, uh, the, of, of this century. What does that do to you? And you are going to be the generation that lives through this. You're not going to be content with people my, like me saying, well done, well done. How far are you ready to push? We are ready to strike for another 42 weeks and another 52 weeks. We're ready to strike and continue to put pressure on elected officials because whenever we would meet with elected officials, when Greta came to Washington, D.C. and joined me at the White House, we met with different elected officials and they told us that we need to continue striking and continue putting pressure on them because on the inside that helps for them to um, advocate for action. So we'll continue to do this until we, ha we see action. Alice, do you think that the word is getting out there? Because the European Commission recently introduced ambitious goals to uh, basically reduce emissions by 2050, or, or end them. Do you think that these young voices are making a difference? Absolutely. I think it's remarkable, the change in attitude just in the last 18 months. I do credit uh, Greta and Jerome and others for uh, actually putting the focus and the spotlight on decision makers who have kept kicking the can down the road, and now time is up. So it is uh, absolutely a need to act. Unfortunately, we still have a partisan divide in the United States on this issue. Even though 70% of Americans or more understand that climate change is occurring and that impacts are already here, but we don't have really a consensus on what to do about it yet, yeah. and we need to work on that. Uh, Ms. Wu, I'd like to bring you in as well because China has been very vocal in talking about the United States not doing enough to help these developing nations to sort of not make the same mistakes that the United States and, of course, China and other nations uh, did as they uh, grew their industrial base. I want to play you a short quote from one Chinese official uh, talking about this issue. The acute issue currently facing multilateral climate efforts is developed countries' insufficient political will to provide support. Now a lot of different funding has been attached to climate and been recalculated. Okay, so let's break this down. Specifically, the United States, Australia, others are saying, look, we're sorry that these developing nations are in this point, but we don't want to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to help them. What can be done to avoid this kind of pratfall, to make sure uh, that every step is taken to help the developing nations? That's a very good question. I think that's one of the most critical issues now literally uh, to be concluded at Madrid and the COP25. And, uh, you know, as, as early on, you know, like David and all the other colleagues mentioned, we are already living in the climate crisis. 
and uh, we do have the history, legacy, historic issues there. And then there is a fairness, there is a compensation mechanism that should be in place to make sure developed countries will provide financial and technical and other support for developing countries, not only just for compensation, but more importantly, help them to make sure you know, they, they really take on the right path towards a sustainable future rather than repeating the industrialization process like U.S. and many other industrialized countries have taken so far. I know from, from China perspective, as I said, while the global debate is around whether or not who should take on what kind of responsibility and how much, which is absolutely necessary because it's a fair equity issues there. But living in China, the, really the focus of the country, of the society, is about how to, right? As China mm -hmm. is today the largest emitter, and we have to figure out actually quickly the solution. So it's, there's a quite a different, it's a contrast actually between the global process and multilateralism, which is a challenge tremendously now, but at the country level, particularly in China, the political will, the society, the technology transformation, the industrialization, everything seems to be so aligned at this moment. And this is one of the bright spots that really offer the biggest hope. Yeah, Jerome, there's no question we are living in climate change right now. Look at the powerful storms, uh, the Arctic on fire, permafrost melting. What is it going to take? beyond strikes to change the mindset of, of power brokers. It's going to take millions of young people taking to the streets, and then it's going to take millions of young people going to the polls. And that's why I founded One Million of Us, is to make sure that we have one million young people in, in the United States and around the world so that young people have the ability to educate themselves about how to vote, but also understand why we're voting and the power of voting. And also, we have to change the mindset of world governments as well to make sure that we have international networks of accountability, to make sure that international aid isn't seen as a handout, but as our mm -hmm. responsibility. And that we, we have responsibility to make sure that countries have the quality of life that they need to survive in the age of the climate crisis. So that's really what we're advocating for, is for young people to go from the streets to the polls, and then from the polls, world governments will start taking action to work as one united planet. Okay. Um, Alice, we also have to think about whether COP25 was a success or failure, at least they're talking. And this is what the uh, UN uh, rep had to say in talking about, let's not surrender, let's continue to fight. Okay, as you can guess, we are having technical issues, but <laughs> you kind of get the gist. You know he's gonna say, that it's, it's, it's out there, we have to do it right now. Does it give you hope that you hear young people like Jerome and in China, Chinese leaders saying, look, whether it's the middle class pushing us to make change because he can't breathe during the winter months and, and summer months in, in, in Beijing, do you feel hopeful? Is there reason to be hopeful? Absolutely. I believe that this is an issue that we can address. We can be successful. We do have some baked in impacts that we will continue to suffer, but we can build resilience to those uh, and we can also cut our emissions. But as we've heard, it's going to take collective action. It's going to take voters signaling that climate change is of importance and that we need to do better now. So I am, uh, whether it's protest, voting, there will be change because the impacts will affect those across the nation who are going to start caring a lot more. Ms. Wu, we only have about 15 seconds, 20 seconds. I'd really like to hear you wrap up and tell us the way you think China is moving forward. China is definitely moving forward. I'm delighted to see China continues on that pathway. I'm even more excited about the EU is committing to zero, uh, net zero uh, emission by 2050. And even more so, I think the younger generation is coming on board really to pressure to put things forward. Okay, Ms. Wu, Alice, and Jerome, I think we're going to hear more from you in the future as well. Thank you all for joining us. We appreciate it. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Sean Cadlebs in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us, everyone.